In the Time of the Butterflies by Julia Alvarez, Part 3, Chapter 12. This is the last part of Chapter 12. Page 283. Talk of the People, Voice of God. November 25, 1960. The soldier was standing on the side of the road with his thumb out, dressed in a camouflage uniform and black laced-up boots. The sky was low with clouds, a storm coming. On this lonely mountain road, I felt sorry for him. What do you say? I asked the others. We were evenly divided. I said yes, Mate said no, Patria said whatever. You decide, we told Rufino. He was fast becoming our protector and guide. None of Bernigal's other drivers would take us over the pass. Mate had grown suspicious of everyone since Tio Jose's visit. He's a soldier, she reminded us. On my side of the argument, I added, so? We'll all be safer. Uh, we'll be all the safer. He's so young. Patria noted as we approached the shoulder where he stood. It was, it was just an observation, but it rippled the scales, and Rufino stopped to offer the boy a ride. He sat in front with Rufino, twisting his cap in his hands. The uniform was too large, and the starched shoulders stuck out in crisp, unnatural angles. For a minute, it worried me that he seemed so uncomfortable. Maybe he was up to something. But as I studied the closely cropped head and the boyish slenderness of his neck, I decided he was just not used to riding around with ladies. So I made conversation, asking him what he thought of this and that. He was headed back to Porta Plata after a three-night furlough to meet his newborn son in Tamboril. We offered him our congratulations, though I thought he was much too young to be a father, or a soldier for that matter. Someone was going to have to take in that uniform. Maybe we could do alterations in our new shop. I remember the camouflage fatigues I'd sewn for myself last November, ages ago it seemed now, the exercises I used to do to get in shape for the revolution. Back then we believed we'd be in these mountains as guerrillas before the year was over. And here it was late November, a year later, and we were riding over the pass in a rented jeep to visit our husbands in prison. The three butterflies, two of them too skittish to sit next to the windows facing the steep drop just inches from the slippery road. One of them, just as scared, but back to her old habits of pretending there was nothing to fear, as El Señor Roosevelt had said, but being afraid. I made myself look down the side of the mountain at the gleaming rocks below, the dangerous possibilities, the fumes from the bad muffler, the bumpiness of the road. I felt a queasiness in my stomach. Give me one of those chiclets after all, I asked Mate. She'd been chomping on hers ever since we started to climb the mountain on this curving stretch of road. It was our fourth trip to see them since their transfer to Puerto Plata. We had left the children home this time. They had already been on the previous they'd already been on the previous Friday to see their daddies, and every one of them had gotten car sick on the way there and back. This mountain road made everyone queasy. Tell me something, I asked the young soldier in the front seat. What is it like being posted in Puerto Plata? The fort there was one of the biggest, most strategic in the country. Its walls stretched out gray and ominous for miles, and its spotlights beamed even into the Atlantic. It was a popular coast for invasions, therefore heavily guarded. Have you seen any action yet? The young soldier half turned in his seat, surprised that a woman should interest herself in such things. I just joined last February when the call went out. So far I have only done prison detail. I exchanged a glance with my sisters in the back seat. You must... Uh, get some important prisoners from time to time. Patria dug her elbow in my ribs, biting her lip so as not to smile. He nodded gravely, wanting to impress us with his own importance uh, as their guard. Two politicals came just this last month. What'd they do? Mate asked in an impressed voice. The boy hesitated. I'm not really sure. Patria took both Mate's and my hands in her own. Are they going to be executed, you think? I don't believe so. I heard they were going to be moved back to the capital in a few weeks. How odd, I thought. Why go to all the trouble of transferring the boys up north only to ship them back in a month? We had already decided on moving to Puerto Plata and opening a store, and this news would ruin that plan. But then, this was just a boy in a too big uniform. What did he know? The storm started up about then. Rufino let down the canvas flaps and told the show soldier how to do his side. We snapped the back panels in place. The inside of the jeep grew dark and stuffy. 
Soon the downpour was upon us. The heavy rain hit the canvas top with the sound of slaps. I could barely hear Patria and Mate talking, much less Rufino and the young soldier up front. Maybe we should think it over, Patria was saying. Before our prison visit today, we had planned to look at some rental houses. Monolo's friend Rudy and his wife Pilar had lined up for us. It had all been decided. We would be moving to Puerto Plata with the children by the 1st of December, opening up a little store at the front of the house. The reaction to our traveling had finally become too disturbing. Every time we left the house, people came out on the road and blessed us. When we got back, we felt obliged to blow the horn as if to say, We're here, safe and sound. Dede and Mama got weepy every time we started out. Those are just rumors, I'd say, trying to comfort them. Talk of the people, voice of God. Mama would answer, reminding me of the old saying. Rufino, if it's too bad and you want to stop, Patria had come forward in her seat. We could see there was something there was nothing to be seen out the front but sheets of water. We can't we can wait until the storm's over. No, no, don't preoccupy yourselves. Rufino was almost shouting to be heard above the pounding rain. Somehow a yelled reassur reassurance did not sound very reassuring. We'll be in Puerto Plata by noon. Si Dios quiere, uh, she reminded him. Si Dios quiere, he agreed. It was reassuring to see the young soldier's head nod in agreement until he added, God and Trujillo willing. <laughs> this was Patria's first visit to see Manolo and Leandro since they'd been moved. Usually on Thursdays, she was headed down to La Victoria to visit Pedrito with the regular ride that didn't return until Friday midday. By that time Mate and I had already left for Puerto Plata accompanied by one of the other of our mothers-in-law. Since the rumors had gotten so bad both of them had virtually moved in with us. Their sons had made them promise they wouldn't let us out of their sight. Those poor women. The night before Mate and I had been readying ourselves for our trip today talking away just the two of us. Patria was still in the capital, and Dede's little one was sick, and so she was home taking care of him. Mate was doing my nails when we heard the sound of a car pulling into the driveway. Mate's hand jerked, and I could see that she had painted the whole top of my thumb red. We both tiptoed down the hall to the living room and found Mama angling the jealousy just so. We all sighed with relief when we heard Patria's voice thanking her ride. And what are you doing traveling at this time of night? Mama scolded before Patria was even in the door. I got a ride back tonight with Elsa, Patria explained. There were five already in the car, but she was nice enough to squeeze me in. I've been wanting to go see the boys. We'll discuss that in the morning, Mama said in her non-negotiable voice, hurting us out of the room by flipping off the lights. In our bedroom, Patria was full of talk about Pedrito. Ay, Dios mio, that man was so romantic today. She raised her arms over her head and stretched in that full-bodied way of cats. Ipa, Mate egged her on. She smiled a pleased, dreamy smile. I told him I wanted to see the boys tomorrow and he gave me his permission. Patria Mercedes, I was laughing. You asked for his permission. What can he do from prison to stop you? Patria gave me a quizzical look as if the answer was obvious. He could have said, no, you can't go. Next morning, we had Mama almost convinced that the three of us would be just fine traveling by ourselves when did they rushed in, breathless. She looked around at the signs of our imminent departure. Her eye fell on Patria, putting on her scarf. And what are you doing here? she asked. Before Patria could explain, Rafina was at the door. Anytime you ladies are ready, good day, he said, nodding towards Mama and Dede. Mama murmured her good days, and Dede gave us gave the chauffeur the imperious look of a mistress whose servant has disobeyed her wishes. All three of you are going? Dede was shaking her head. What about Doña Fafita or Doña Nina? Uh, they, they, need a, they need a rest, I said. I didn't add that we'd be house hunting today. We hadn't told our mothers-in-law or Mama or Lord knows Dede about our plans yet. Why, Mama, with all due respect, are you mad to let them go alone? Mama threw her, up her hands. You know your sisters, was all she said. How handy, Dede said with heavy sarcasm, pacing the room. How very handy for the sim 
to have all three of you sitting pretty in the back seat of that rundown Jeep with a storm brewing in the north. Maybe I should just give them a call. Why not? Rafina was at the door again. We should go, I said, to spare him having to say it again. La benediction, Patricia, uh, Patria called, asking for Mama's blessing. La benediction, mis hijas. Mama turned abruptly as if to hide the worry on her face. She headed towards the bedrooms. As we went out, I could hear her scolding the children who were wailing with disappointment at not being taken on our outing. The day stood by the jeep, blocking our way. I'm going crazy with worry. I'll be the one locked up forever, you'll see, in this madhouse. There was no self-mockery in her voice. We'll come visit you too, I said, laughing. But then seeing her teary, unhappy face, I added, Poor, poor Dede. I took her face in my two hands. I kissed her goodbye and then climbed into the jeep. We were at the counter, paying for the purses. The very correct young sales clerk was taking his time, and the manager had already been by once to hurry him along. With infinite patience, the clerk folded the straps just so, located each purse at the center of a brown parcel paper he painstakingly tore from the roll and commenced creasing the edges. I watched his hands working mesmerized. This must be how God does things, I thought as if he has all the time in the world. We had asked permission for this brief detour uh, to El Gallo on our way to Puerto Plata that day. Our sewing supplies were low again and we needed thread in several colors, seam bindings, and the ribbons to complete November's orders. The drive over the mountain was long. If our nerves cooperated, we could catch up on some of the hand sewing today. When we went to pay, the sales clerk showed us a new shipment of Italian purses. Mate mooned over one in red patent leather with a snap in the shape of a heart, but of course she wouldn't think of such an extravagance, unless she looked up at us. Patria and I were also examining the display case. There was a practical black bag with innumerable zippered pockets and compartments just perfect for Patria's goodwill supplies. Then I spotted a smart leather envelope that would be exactly the thing for a young lawyer to carry, an investment in hope, I thought. Shall we? We looked at each other like naughty schoolgirls. School we hadn't bought ourselves a single thing since before prison. We should, Mate decided. She did not want to be the only one splurging. I didn't need much talking into, but at the last minute, Patria desisted. I just can't. I don't really need it. I felt a flicker of anger at her for her goodness that I didn't want at this moment to live up to. As, she, as he wrapped Mate's first, the man kept his head bowed. But for one fleeting instant, I caught his eyes on us and a look of recognition dawning on his face. How many people on the street, in church, on the sidewalks, in shops like this one, knew who we were? New purses. A sign of good luck coming. Somebody else waiting for the future, I thought. I felt, uh, I felt a flush of embarrassment to be caught shopping when I should have been plotting a revolution. Rufino came in the store with the sidewalk, from the sidewalk where he was parked. We better get started. The rainstorm looks like it's coming, and I want to be over the worst part of the pass by then. The young man looked up from his wrapping. You aren't planning to go over the pass today, are you? My stomach clenched. But then I thought, the more people know, the better. We always go Fridays to Puerto Plata to see the men, I told him. The floor manager came forward, smiling falsely at us, but throwing meaningful looks his attendant's way. Finish up there. You don't want to delay the ladies. The young man hurried off and was back momentarily with our change. He finished wrapping my purse. As he handed it over, the attendant gave me an intent look. Jorge Almonte, he said, or something like that. I put my card in your purse if there should ever be any need. The rain let up just as we came upon La Cumbre, the lonely mountain village that had grown up around one of Trujillo's seldom used mansions. Too isolated, some people said. El Jefe's two-story concrete house sat on top of the mountain above a cluster of little palm huts that seemed to be barely holding on to the cliff. We craned our necks every time we went by. What do, uh, what do we think we'd see? A young girl brought here for a forced rendezvous? The old man himself walking around his grounds, beating the side of his shiny boots with a riding crop? 
The Iron Gateway blazed its five stars above the gleaming T. As we passed, our young soldiers, our young soldier, our young soldier passengers saluted, though no guards were in sight. We drove by shabby palm huts. The one time we had stopped here to stretch our legs, the whole little village had gathered, offering to sell us anything we might want to buy. Things are bad, the villagers complained, looking up towards the big house. Rufino pulled over and rolled up the side flats, a welcome breeze blew in, laden with the smells of damp vegetation. Ladies, Rufino asked us before climbing back in, if you'd like to stop? Patry was sure she did not want to stop. This was her first time, and the road was a little spooky until you got used to it. Just as we were rounding the curve, on that stretch where the house shows the most from the road, I glanced up. Why, look who's there, I said, pointing to the big white Mercedes that sat by the front door. All three of us knew at that same instant what it meant. An ambush lay ahead. Why else was Peña at La Cumbre? We had seen him just this morning in Santiago when we picked up our permissions. Patria's chatty friend had made no mention of him being in our direction. We could not turn around now. Were we being followed? We stuck our heads out the window to see what lay behind as well as ahead. I give myself to San, Mar San Marco de Leon, Patria intoned, repeating the prayer for desperate situations. I found myself mouthing the silly words. Panic was rising up from my toes, through my guts, into my throat. The thunder in my chest exploded. Mate was already wheezing, searching through her purse for her medication. We sounded like a mobile sanatorium. Rufino slowed. Shall we stop at the three crosses? Up ahead on the shoulder there were three white crosses marking the casualties from a recent accident. Suddenly it loomed in my head as the place for an ambush, the last place we should stop. Keep on going, Rufino, I said, and I took great swallows of the cool air that was blowing in on us. To divert ourselves, Mate and I began moving the contents of our old purses into our new ones. The card of Jorge Almonte, attendant, El Gallo, found its way on my hand. The gold rooster logo crowed with, from the upper right-hand corner. I turned the card over. The words were written in big black letters in a hurried hand. Avoid the pass. My hand shook. I would not tell the others. It could only make things worse, and Mate's asthma uh, had just begun to calm down. But in my head, I was working it all out. It was a movie scene that became suddenly, terrifyingly real. This soldier was a plant. How foolish we had been, picking him up on this lonely country road. I began chatting him up, trying to catch him in a lie. What time was he due at the fort, and why had he hitched rather than caught a ride in an army truck? Finally, he turned around halfway in his seat. I could see that he was afraid to speak. I'll coax it out of him, I thought. What is it? You can tell me. You ask more questions than me, mujer, when I get home, he blurted out. His color deepened at the rude suggestion that I could be like his wife. Patria laughed and tapped my head with a gloved hand. That coco fell right on your head. I could see she, too, felt sure of him now. The sun broke through the clouds. The shafts of light shone like blessings on the far valley. The Ark of His Covenant, I thought. I will not destroy my people. We had been silly, letting ourselves believe all those crazy rumors. To entertain us, Mate began telling riddles she was sure we hadn't heard. He humored her. We humored her. Then Rufino, who collected them, knowing how much Mate loved them, offered a new one to her. We began to descend toward the coast, the roadside growing more populous, the smell of the ocean air. The isolated little huts gave way to wooden houses and freshly painted shutters and zinc roofs advertising Ron Bermudez on one side, Dios y Trujillo on the other side. Our soldier had been laughing loudly at the riddles he always guessed wrong. He had one of his own to contribute. It turned out to be much nastier than any of Mate's. Rufino was indignant. Adio, are you forgetting there are ladies in the car? Patria leaned forward, patting a hand on each man's shoulder. Now, Rufino, every egg needs a little pepper. We all laughed, glad for the release of the pent-up tension. Mate crossed her legs, jiggling them up and down. We're going to have to stop soon unless you quit making me laugh. She was famous for her tiny bladder. In prison, she'd had to practice holding it in since she didn't like going out to the latrine with strange guards in the middle of the night. 
Everybody's serious, I ordered, because we sure can't stop here. We were at the outskirts of the city now. Brightly colored houses sat prettily in their cut plots side by side. The rain had washed the lawns, and the grasses and hedges shone emerald green. Everything was a fresh joy to see. Groups of children played in puddles in the street, scattering as the jeep approached so as not to be sprayed. An impulse seized me. I called out to them, We're here, safe and sound. They stopped their play and looked up. Their baffled little faces did not know what to make of us, but I kept waving until they waved back. I felt giddy as if I had been granted a reprieve from my worst fears. When Mate needed a piece of paper for her discarded chiclet, I pulled out Jorge's card. Menelo was upset at his mother for letting us come alone. She promised me she wouldn't let you out of her sight. But my love, I said, folding my hands over his, reason it out. What could Dania Fifita do to protect me, even if I were in danger? I had a brief, ludicrous picture of the old, rather heavy woman banging a sim calier over, his, over the head with her ubiquitous black purse. Menelo pulled, out, pulled and pulled at his ear, a nervous habit he had developed in prison. He moved me to see him so... It moved me to see him so nakedly affected by his long months of suffering. Promise is a promise, he concluded, still aggrieved. Oh dear, there would be words next time, and then Doña Fafita's tears all the way home. Manolo's color had uh, started to come back. This was definitely a better prison, brighter, cleaner than La Victoria. Every day our friends Rudy and Pilar sent over a hot meal, and after they ate, the men were allowed to walk around in the prison yard for half an hour. Leandro, the engineer, joked that he and Manolo uh, could have mashed at least a ton of uh, sugar cane by now if they'd been rigged up to with harnesses like a team of oxen. We sat around in the little yard where they usually brought us during our visits if the weather was good. Unaccountably, after the bad storm, the sun had come out in the late afternoon. It shone on the barracks, painted a pea-green, amoeba-shaped camouflage that looked almost playful, on the storybook towers with the flags flying in a row, on the bars gleaming brightly as if someone had taken the time to polish them. If you didn't let yourself think what this place was, you could almost see it in a promising light. Tentatively, Petria brought up the topic. Have you been told anything about being moved back? Leandro and Manolo looked at each other. A worried look passed between them. Did Petrito hear something? No, no, nothing like that, Petria soothed them. Uh, and then she looked <clears throat> to me to bring up what the young soldier had reported in the car, the two politicals would be going back to La Victoria in a, in a few weeks. But I did not want to worry them. Instead, I began to describe the perfect little house we'd seen earlier. <clears throat> Petri and Mate joined in. What we didn't tell the men was that we had not rented the house after all. If they were going to be moved back to La Victoria, there was no use. The big white Mercedes parked at the door of La Cumbre crossed my mind. I leaned forward as if to leave its image physically at the back of my mind. We heard the clanging doors in, in the distance. Footsteps approached. There were shouted greetings, the click and slap of gun salutes. The guard was changing. Patria opened her purse and withdrew her scarf. Ladies, the shades of night begin to fall. The wayfarer hurries home. Nice poetry, I laughed, to lighten the difficult moment. I had such a hard time saying goodbye. You're not going back tonight? Manolo looked shocked at the idea. It's too late to start out. I want you to stay with Rudy and Pilar and head back tomorrow. I touched his raspy cheek with the back of my hand. He shut his eyes, giving himself to my touch. You mustn't worry so. Look how clear that sky is. Tomorrow we'll probably have another bad storm. We're better off going home this evening. We all looked up at the deepening golden sky. The few low-lying clouds were moving quickly across it, as if heading home themselves before it got too dark. I didn't tell him the real reason why I didn't want to stay with his friends. Pilar uh, had confided in me that as we drove around looking at houses, that Rudy's business was about to collapse. She did not have to say it, but I guessed why. We had put more distance between us for their sake. Manolo uh, held my head in both his hands. I wanted to lose myself in his sad, dark eyes. Please, mi amor, there are too many rumors around. I reasoned with him. If you gave me a peso for every premonition, dream, 
admonition that we've been told this month, we'd be able to buy ourselves another set of purses. Mate held hers up and nodded for me to hold up mine. Then there was the call. Time! The guards closed in with their flat, empty faces showing us no consideration. Time! We st stood, said our hurried goodbyes, our whispered prayers and endearments. Remember, don't forget, Dios te bendiga, mi amor. A final embrace before they were led away. Uh, the light was falling quickly. I turned for a last look, but they had already disappeared into the barracks at the end of the yard. We stopped at the little restaurant gas pump on the way out of town. The umbrellas had all been taken down in preparation for night, and only the little tables remained. Since Mate and Patria were thirsty and wanted a refreshment, I went and made the call. The line was busy. I paced back and forth in front of the phone the way one does to remind someone ahead of the others that the others are waiting, but neither Mama nor Dede could know that I was waiting for them to get off the line. Still busy, I came back and told my sisters. Mate picked up her new purse and mine from the extra chair. Sit with us. Come on. But I couldn't see how I could sit. I guess it was getting to me, listening to everyone's worries. Give it another five minutes, Patria suggested. It seemed reasonable enough. In five minutes, whoever was on would be off the line. If not, it was a sure sign that one of the children had left the phone off the hook, and who knew when Tono or Fela would discover it. Rufino leaned back against the back of the jeep, his, eye, his arms crossed. Every so often he'd look up at the sky, checking the time. I think maybe I will have a beer, I said at last. Ipa, Mate, Mate said. She was drinking her lemonade through a straw, daintily like a girl, trying to make the sweet pleasure last. We would be stopping at least once more on the road. I could see that. Rufino, can I get you one? He looked away, a sign that, indeed, he would like a cold beer, but he was too shy to say so. Off I went to the bar for our two presidentes. I tried the number again, uh, while the obliging proprietor dug up his two coldest ones from the bottom of the deep freeze. Still busy, I told our little table when I got back. Minerva, Patria shook her head. That wasn't five minutes. The afternoon was deepening towards evening. I felt the cooler air of night blowing off the mountain. We had not brought our shawls. I imagined Mama, just now seeing them, draped brightly on the backs of the chairs and going to the window once again to watch for car lights. Undoubtedly, she would pass the phone. She would see if it was off the hook. Uh, she would le heave a sigh and replace it in its cradle. I went back to try one more time. I give up, I said when I came back. I think we should just go. Patria looked up the at the mountain. Behind it was another one and another one and then we will be home. I feel a little uneasy. I mean, that road is so deserted. It's always that way, I informed her, the veteran mountain pass traveler. Mate finished the last of her drink and sucked the sugar through the straw, making a rude sound. I promised Jackie I'd tuck her in tonight. Her voice had a whiny edge. Mate had not been separated from her baby overnight since we'd come home from prison. What do you say, Rufino? I asked him. We can make it to La Combre before dark, for sure. From there, it's all downhill. But it's up to you, he added, not wanting to express a preference. Surely his own bed with Delisa curled beside him was better than a little cot in the tiny servant's room at the back of Rudy and Pilar's yard. He had a baby, too. It struck me I'd never asked him how old the child was, boy or girl. I say we go, I said, but I still read hesitancy in Patria's face. Just then, a public, a public works truck pulled into the station. Three men got out. One veered off behind the building to the smelly toilet we had been forced to use once and swore never again. The other two came up to the counter, shaking their legs and pulling at their crotches the way men getting out of cars do. They greeted the proprietor warmly, giving him half-arm abrazos over the counter. How are you, compadre? No, no, we can't stay. Pack us up a dozen of those pork fries over there. In fact, hand us a couple to eat right now. The proprietor talked to the men as he filled their order. Where are you headed at this hour, boys? The driver had taken a large bite of the fried rind in his hand. Truck needs to be in Tamboril by dark. He spoke with his mouth full, licking his greasy fingers 
when he was done and then tweezing a handkerchief out of his back pocket to wipe himself. Tito, where is that Tito? He turned around and scanned the tables, his eye falling on us. We smiled and he took his cap off and held it to his heart, the flirt. Rufino straightened up protectively from his post next to the car. When Tito came running from behind the pumps, his buddies were already inside the truck gunning the motor. Can a man shit in peace? He called out. But the truck was inching forward, and he had to execute a tricky mount on the passenger's running board. I was sure they had performed the maneuver before for a lady or two. They honked as they pulled out into the road. We looked at each other. Their lightheartedness made us feel safer somehow. We'd be following that truck all the way to the other side of the mountains. Suddenly the road was not so lonesome. What do you say? I said standing up. Shall I try one more time? I looked towards the phone. Patria closed her purse with a decisive snap. Let's just go. We moved quickly now towards the jeep, hurrying as if we had to catch up with that truck. I don't know quite how to say this, but it was as if we were girls again, walking through the dark part of the yard, a little afraid, a little excited by our fears, anticipating the lighted house just around the bend. That's the way I felt as we started up the first mountain.